What would cause an author to trash an entire 110,000 word book and rewrite it? In this video, author Amy Popel talks about finding the humor in that misstep and the secret writing techniques she used in one of her popular novels. Hi, it's Angie from HEC Books, where authors reveal the not so glamorous real world of writing. If this is your first time here, click the subscribe button. Now here's author Amy Popel. Make sure to watch until the end when she talks about her hilarious book trailers. Let's talk a little bit about your writing process. So I've read that you do not outline. You're not an outline lining kind of author. Is that true? It is true. So I taught high school English for years and I really emphasized how important it is to structure your ideas. And I think for any kind of academic writing, that's Im really important. I don't want to say that there's no method to it because I do I do, I do so many drafts. You cannot imagine how much rewriting I do. There's just so much editing. Like I always say to people, if they say I'm afraid to write that first chapter because it's gonna be bad, and I'm like, yes, yes it is going to be bad. And that's okay. It's going to actually be terrible. <laughs> Don't, but you can't edit until you have something on the page. You have to get it down first and then you can make it better. And then you can do it again and make it a little bit better. And it's gonna be 12 times, maybe more, before you're finished. I focus so much on the characters and the way I get to know the characters is by writing about them and then I get to know them better and then I suddenly think oh wait that thing that she said in chapter one she wouldn't say that she would say this or that choice that this character makes in the third chapter he wouldn't make that choice this is what he would do so I continually go back to the beginning so I might have sort of a premise a concept and I think all outliners will tell you that they rewrite, they adjust their outlines. So it's not as though anyone, I think, just outlines a book and then just writes to the outline. If the outline's failing you, you have to tweak it. And I think when you notice that you're trying to push the character to do something just so that you can get to point B, maybe point B isn't where they, maybe you need to rethink point B. And it's so much work when you have to do that. Like I, I, I sometimes, like I have had days where I've realized I had to rewrite, like in the case of this book, I pretty much started over again after oh, no. I'd basically finished the book. And in that case, it wasn't a character choice situation. It was that I realized that I had not found the best perspective to tell the story from. Really? And I sort of stuck to it. And that's why I, I, I you know, I think it's important to always keep open-minded. I just sort of decided that this was the way I wanted to tell the story. Can you tell us what, it, what it, I, how it was? I wrote the entire book first person from Evelyn's perspective, so the oh. grandmother in the story. I had this idea that I wanted her sort of a little bit back and to have the three women, Olivia, Lauren, and Melinda, have their drama, and I wanted Evelyn sort of sitting back and watching it all and bringing her perspective to it all. To, do, to give her that responsibility for the entire book, it was just too much to put on her and I was very limited, and it's such a big role to be a first-person narrator that you're carrying, that, that character carries the entire story, and to justify her existence as my narrator, I kept writing her backstory into the book, and more backstory, and more backstory, and then at one point, I just sent her off on a trip. She went off and she visited her, she went to visit her daughter-in-law in Boston, and off she went, and she just abandoned the three women in the city. And I ended up sort of with two books that didn't make sense together, so I started over. Um, I don't consider that a waste of time. It's not efficient, as I said, but I never considered that a waste of time because all that work was still getting to know the characters. So when it came to writing Evelyn's one chapter in third person, <laughs> not in first person, I knew her so well that it was it was a, just a joy to write her chapter because I just knew what she would do. Oh, that's such a change. Yeah. But I like it because then because she would have never known what Melinda was thinking or what exactly. Yeah. And when I decided um, that it, that it was wrong, that I had made a mistake, it was like just the it was the most freeing thing in the world because yeah. all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh. 
I get to hear what Leo thinks and yeah. I get to hear what Melinda thinks. Yeah. And I like to do, I said I don't outline, but I do like to do some kind of pattern with my chapters, like in musical chairs, because it's a book about classical music. No reader would ever notice this. This is sort of a thing I do for myself. I wrote the whole book in like a waltz, like so sets of three chapters. Um, where my main character Bridget gets a chapter, my main character Will gets a chapter, and then because it's musical chairs, I have an empty seat, an empty spot. And I filled that empty spot with a different character in each round. So it was that kind of a pattern, if it can work. And again, if it doesn't work, I have to throw it out, come up with something new. But if it works, I like having that kind of internal structure for myself. Yeah. Um, and also it makes sure that you're hearing from everybody in kind of a balanced way. I love that you were willing to to fail in both situations. You're like, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, but I like yeah. that you didn't get all wrapped up in it. I did for like two days. <laughs> I went to bed and just mourned the idea of this. You know, they could talk about kill your darlings. Like I killed yeah. every single one of them. Yeah. Um, that is not that's not my favorite day for sure. But you have to do what's right for the story you're trying to tell. And if that meant starting over, I had to start over. And none of this was supposed to be happening anyway. I mean, I, I'm i still sort of stunned that I'm writing books anyway. <laughs> so I feel like it's not a race. And I feel as though I'm willing to take the time that it needs to take to get it right. Yeah. It's definitely discouraging when you realize that something's not working. And in fact, I think it's kind of hilarious that I, <laughs> that I had to scrap 110,000 words and start from scratch. Oh and yes, I see the absurdity in that and I see the humor in it and I also see that forcing a book that's not working, it's not there's no joy in that. It's yeah. just it's what do they say? It's a square peg in a round hole. You're just trying to make something happen that's not going to work. So generally speaking, how long does it take you to write a book? One one that you keep. <laughs> one that I keep. I'm not a book a year person. I'm envious of people who are and I'm sort of just awed by people who can write a book a year. I think it's amazing. I'm just not that efficient. I'm more like 18 months to two years. Um, and I write very much in sessions. Like I'll have like three months where it's just kind of all that I do. And I, I, I stop exercising. I put a lot of the things that I should be doing to the side. Um, and I just focus on that. Binge writing, isn't that what you guys binge writing. Use? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm a binge writer. I can't, I'm not, I would love to be sort of a nine to five writer where like I wake up and I exercise and then I sit at my desk. But what my husband will note is like first thing in the morning when I'm in one of these little modes, I've got my laptop. What did I do last night? Where did I, and, and he'll get off and go to work and leave and come back six hours later and I'm still in my pajamas. So bad for the posture. Oh right. my gosh. Like I'm just hunched over and he'll say, didn't you? get up? Did you do anything? And I'm, I just, I didn't. You're like, yes, look at but my I'm computer. Like, yes, I, <laughs> I'm like, less do you think I didn't accomplish anything today? Um, I did. It doesn't, it's not attractive and it's not um, especially healthy maybe. But I, again, it's the way, it's just how I the, do things. Yeah. The glamorous world of writers, right? Very <laughs> glamorous. Yes. In my pajamas. It's, it's definitely not especially glamorous, but yeah. Oh my goodness. People, if they want to laugh, watch your book trailers. Those are hilarious. Those are fun to make. So every writer always wonders about marketing. How should I market my book? And should I get on TikTok and dance? And like, no, no, definitely hard pass. Not going to happen. So I thought, what can I do? So for three of my four books, I've made book trailers. And instead of doing what some people do, which is just sort of music in the background and some quotes about the book or whatever, I try to think of a scene that I can write that has something to do with the book but isn't in the book. Mm -hmm. So something that would tell you a bit about the story and give you a sense of the tone of the story, mm -hmm. but not something that takes place in the story. So I write those and then I rope in whatever family members I can get to participate and they're all on my website. If and you watch them, you'll notice the recurring characters. Yes. You'll be like, wait, that, that yes, dog exactly. is it. <laughs> exactly, yes, my dog has had starring roles in two of them. Yes. Yeah. This has been so much fun. Oh, thank, thank you, Amy. you. No, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for watching. Do Amy Popel and me a favor. Give this video a thumbs up 
and keep an eye out for my next interview with the incomparable Sally Hepworth about her domestic thriller, The Soulmate. Get notified when that conversation comes out by clicking subscribe.